All right. Hi, everyone. It's Dr. Steph. I'm an assistant professor at the University of Toronto Faculty of Medicine, where I teach financial literacy and transition to practice. I'm also on Instagram and YouTube at Breaking Bad Debt. Today, I'm joined by my co-lecturer, Dr. Mark Soth, who is an ICU doctor that runs the Looney Doctor blog. In the first of a series of short videos to help beginners and students better understand investing, taxes, and incorporation, Today's topic is going to be about asset allocation ETFs or all in one ETFs. That's the other term for that. So if there are any questions or ideas for future lecture topics, please leave a comment and don't forget to like and subscribe. So Mark, I'll let you take it away. Great. Thanks for having me, Stephanie. And I hope this is a we're going to work through a number of topics over time uh, to try to build up a nice database for people to use when they're trying to start out uh, learning about their personal finances. And the first topic I'm going to talk about today is asset allocation ETFs. And it's probably not going to be everything you need to know, but it's going to be a good basic uh, background uh, that we can then use for some of the other uh, topics that, we, that we're going to tie it into uh, in some future episodes. So uh, what I want to do with this episode is actually set some of the background information uh, so that you know why you might want to use an asset allocation ETF and what will be the potential advantages, disadvantages uh, compared to other options that are out there. So the overview of what I'd like to cover today is what's an asset allocation ETF, what's asset allocation, why we would use funds as opposed to individual stocks. We'll talk a bit about mutual funds versus ETFs. And then that sets the scene for an asset allocation ETF, which combines all those things together. And the other uh, bonus of using an asset allocation ETF is that it takes care of the rebalancing uh, job for you, which is one of the things that scares people off from uh, DIY investing, but this actually makes it go away. Then we, I'll talk a bit a little bit. Are there is there any evidence that an asset allocation ETF may give, give you an edge over even trying to build your own ETF portfolio? And then the, also what some of the potential pitfalls are. Uh, I think most of them are issues for someday, or maybe even never. But uh, I'm going to introduce a few of those and then finish off with a few of the common asset allocation ETFs uh, that are out there. So the first question is, you know, what is asset allocation? And asset allocation is basically the basket of different investments uh, that we hold. Now, we may count some of our savings in our asset allocation, but savings are really things that should be in cash or cash equivalents because that's money that we're going to need to access sometime in the next three years. And money that you may need over the next three years is not money that you should be investing. Investing is a long-term endeavor, which means you're going to be doing it for many years, probably decades. And so that I would count differently. Another type of asset in your, in your portfolio might be some kind of private business that you have. These tend to be less liquid, which means you can't easily buy and sell them. And when you go to try to buy and sell them, there's a lot of cost associated with that. So things like a real estate investment, or if you were to run some type of private business, or use private equity, those kind of fall into the private uh, business aspect of it. And what we're going to focus on in terms of the part of our asset allocation uh, today is really what we call liquid investments. So these are investments that you could sell at any time with a relatively low cost, access the money and use it if you need to. But again, because they're investments, that should be over a much longer time frame. Now, there's two big things that you can invest in, and you mix all of these together in your garden of your portfolio so that you get a nice variety of uh, assets together. Now, one of those assets might be stocks, which would be buying a share in a company, so or also called equity, because so you own part of the company. And what you're doing when you buy a stock is you're buying a, a fraction of the future profits of that company. And that means a couple of things. One of the things that it means is that the risk that you have is the risk that's associated with the future earnings of the company. And that's all priced into the price of the stock. So as the future prospects of that company go change, the stock price goes up or the stock price goes down based on that. And that's changing all the time with new information that's out there. So that's why stocks are what we call very volatile, meaning the prices fluctuate up and down very rapidly uh, on, a, on a minute by minute, hour by hour basis. Now, the upside of using stocks is, or 
equity as part of your portfolio is that really the only limit to the upside is how much companies can grow their profits in the future, which really is kind of an unlimited upside potential. Now, of course, along with that comes increased risk because risk and return are always very closely related with investing and a company could go bankrupt and go down to zero. So there's more risk and return associated with investing in equity or stocks. The other big group of investments that we can have that are liquid are bonds. And bonds is basically loaning money. So you give your money to whatever company or government uh, wants it, and they in turn pay you interest. And if you hold the bond through to its maturity, which could be any period of time uh, that you select from, uh, then the bond is worth what you paid for it. And along the way, you collect the interest. Now, because it's not, uh, it, because it's not as uh, rapidly changing in terms of prospects, and it's worth what you started with if it goes to maturity, it's going to be much less volatile in price than a stock would be. Now, at the same time, it also has limited upside potential. So you hold that bond to maturity, it's going to be worth what you pay, what you lent in, in, and the interest along the way. So there's a limit to the upside. But on the other hand, if whatever government or company goes bankrupt or has financial issues, the bondholders get paid first. So the risk isn't non-existent, but it's much, much lower uh, than it would be with stocks. And most of the bonds that are out there are actually issued by governments. And governments are backed up by the entire ability of taxing its population and all of the assets of that, that country. So it would be very unusual for bonds to go to nothing. So what we're trying to do is we're going to have to try to make an important decision with our asset allocation. So our overall asset allocation are all of these different things that we hold together in our in our portfolio garden. But one of the biggest decisions that we make with our liquid investments is the stock to bond allocation. And what we're trying to do with that is we're trying to invest it with as many stocks as we can to take that investment risk, which is the risk of getting a higher return, but also the risk of the company uh, doing worse than expected. And we're trying to balance that with enough bonds in there for the behavioral risk. And the behavioral risk is the risk of us not being able to stick to the plan. So when prices go up and down uh, and are very volatile, it's very uh, tempting from our human behavior standpoint for us to buy things when they're desirable and the price is high and sell things when they're undesirable and the price is low. We're very strongly hardwired that way. And by using a mix of stocks and bonds together, that allows us to dampen that volatility and make it so that we can stick to the plan. So you're trying to find that balance between taking enough risk to get the returns and dampening it with bonds so that you can stick to that plan. So why would we use a fund? Basically by using a, a stock or a bond fund, instead of buying one or two stocks or bonds or a few stocks or bonds, you buy one fund and it holds literally thousands of different individual stocks and bonds. So you could, you could buy a stock fund that covers a variety of different areas, which would be like a different plant for each of these plants in our pot. So you could have one that covers Canada, one covers US markets, you could have one that covers non-North American developed markets or emerging markets. You can have all sorts of different funds that cover different markets. And within each of those funds are gonna be a whole bunch of different companies. So using a fund is an instant way to get diversification. So one of the questions that may come up is, okay, well, why would I want to buy all of the stocks and the bonds that are out there or as many of as, as I possibly can when I could just actually pick the best ones and plant my garden with the best plants and avoid having any weeds in there that are bad plants that uh, aren't, aren't going to do me any good. So there's two reasons for that. Uh, one is that the chances of you being able to pick the best stock is very, very low. So if you look over long periods of time, there's a, been a, there was a study done of 90 years of market history, and it shows that only 4% of stocks account for the entire net market gain, which that means if you aren't holding those 4% of stocks, then you're going to actually miss out on the market gains. So if you were just to randomly select stocks, uh, then there's a you know 95% chance or higher that you're going to be picking the wrong ones. And the issue is that we don't know which stocks those 4% are. We only know after the fact which ones they are. We don't know which ones are going to become them. 
So it's very, very difficult to pick the stocks of the ultimate winners. And if you go out there picking stocks if, from that same data set, over half of stocks that you are out there have a lifetime negative gain. So the odds are that you're going to pick something that's going to lose over time. And the most frequent outcome is actually 100% loss. So this is why we want to buy a bundle of stocks that basically owns the whole market so that we can guarantee that we've got that 4% in there. And you know what? Yes, we may have some of those weeds in there too, but the growth of the really good plants are going to smother out those weeds and in the long run lead to a good return for ourselves uh, over time. So, the, and the other reason why we want to hold multiple stocks rather than trying to pick a few winners and losers, and the same thing goes with bonds, is that it's diversification. And diversification is often called the only free lunch in investing. And the reason why that is, is because you could have multiple assets that have the same expected return over a long period of time, but along the way, they're going to be fluctuating up and down. And if you have a few of them, well, when one, if you have one company, as an extreme example, when it goes up, your portfolio goes up. So if it goes up by 20%, things go up by 20%. If it goes down to zero, your entire portfolio goes to zero. That's incredibly emotionally difficult and extremely risky. Whereas if you hold thousands of stocks, then some will be going up and some will be going down and they'll be doing that at different times. And what that does is it averages out the fluctuations in your portfolio to smooth them. And doing that with stocks and bonds is even more powerful because they're less correlated. So you could own a bunch of different stocks, but a lot of companies actually are affected by the same uh, political and economic factors. So they move up and down, not exactly at the same time, but similarly, because they're correlated. And that's why it takes thousands of them to become adequately diversified. Whereas with bonds, they're negatively correlated to stocks most of the time, which means when stocks are going up as a whole, bonds are going down in price. And then when bonds go up in price, the stock market goes down and vice versa. So they tend to work in opposite directions and really help you to smooth that ride out. And that's why having that stock to bond asset allocation is so important. So there's two big ways that we can get funds that allow us to have that instant diversification. The, Mutual funds and exchange traded funds are the most commonly ones that we talk about because they're publicly available. So mutual funds and ETFs have a few ma major differences. Uh, the biggest ones are in the management style and the sales. So mutual funds tend to have an active management style. And what that means is that there are managers who are trying to pick the best stocks. And we've already talked about why that's actually extremely difficult. And they try to do that in a, in a timely fashion and buy them, sell and sell them at the right time to make a profit. And they use all sorts of fancy techniques like uh, technical analysis and they analyze the, the earnings returns from companies and the macroeconomic environment. And they try to put that all together in a way that they're able to beat the market. Uh, but the problem is that it takes a lot of energy to do that and a lot of expertise and the fees that it costs often uh, can drag on that performance. Now, exchange traded funds are usually passively managed, which means they just try to track an index, which means they, they may have, they just try to stay in the middle of the ring and be average and not be pushed out of it. So they're going to hold those stocks that, that those minority of stocks that uh, win, and then the ones that don't do as well, but overall, uh, track that index rather than trying to beat it. And because that's a simple strategy, it also costs a lot less to do it. So what does the data show about carrying those, comparing those strategies to other, each other? Well, there's two big data sets. One is the SPIVA data set, which they've done rolling 10-year periods comparing actively managed funds versus passively managed funds, and shown that oh, over time, actively managed funds usually trail the index uh, compared to a more passive uh, index approach. And the that occurs at about 90%. So about 90% of active managers will not beat the index that they're tracking themselves against. So that means you have a 10% chance of, as an active manager of beating the index net of your fees. And fees are actually very important. There's also a Morningstar data set, which broke down the performance based on fees. 
and from the highest fees funds to the lowest fee funds. So if someone tries to say that their fund is the best and that's why they charge the highest fees because they got the best managers, well, actually it the data shows that fees are strongly related to returns and that the highest fee funds are also the worst performing funds and the lowest fee funds are also the best performing funds. So fees are actually predictive of performance. And you may also say, okay, well, what if I can just go and I'll pick the funds that 10% of funds that do well well, there's also data from Spiva, which is called the persistence data, which shows that if you tick the top performing funds from a, from a year and then follow them out over the next five years, they actually trail the markets by worse than random chance. So picking yeah, the most recent winners are also the ones who are most likely to underperform moving forward. So it's very difficult uh, to try to pick an active managed strategy that's going to win. So that's why... I think that ETFs are often a better way for people to go. Now I say usually active managed and usually passive index tracking because you can have passively indexing mutual funds and you can have actively managed ETFs as well. They tend to be most commonly uh, split this way, but it's not always that way. The other thing that differentiates them besides the common strategy used is the sales. And a mutual fund is, is sold via a dealer or an advisor. And because of that, not only are there management fees embedded in there, there's also fees to pay the people that are selling uh, the products or providing financial advice along with selling the products together. Whereas the difference with ETFs is that you can buy them directly. You just have to have a discount brokerage account, which is like online banking. It's very similar. Discount brokerages allow you to buy and sell things directly from the talk exchanges. And you can do that for usually either free or under $10 per trade. And that's why the, the big difference between them is really that mutual funds are free to buy, but they cost you between 05 and 3% per year to own. And that fee drags is probably is likely to drag on your performance. And we've, I've spoken about the DA evidence to suggest that. Whereas ETFs are free or less than $10 to buy, but because they have a much simpler investment strategy and they don't have to pay for salespeople uh, as much, the fees are much lower, like an order of magnitude, 0.03 to 0.5% per year to own uh, compared to mutual funds. So asset allocation ETFs fall into this ETF category, and that's why I think it's important to understand the difference between that and mutual funds uh, when you're thinking about them as a possible option. So that brings me to what is an asset allocation ETF. Basically, an asset allocation ETF is you take your money, you put it into the asset allocation ETF, you buy that uh, usually during using a discount brokerage, and then it automatically builds that, that into a globally diversified portfolio that holds thousands of stocks for you. And it's going to have a mix of companies from different countries around the world. And within those countries, a variety of different industry groups and companies. So the way that you do that is you would do a risk assessment, a tolerance assessment to decide, you know, what's the best mix of stocks to bonds for your asset allocation. So What's the most amount of stocks that you can tolerate so that you can get the highest potential return, but with enough bonds that you can actually stick to the plan. And then there are different asset allocation ETFs used for different common asset allocations. So you could hear of a 100% equity, which would be all stocks, or 80-20, which is 80% stocks, 20% bonds, or 60-40 would be another common one, which would be 60% stocks, 40% bonds, for example. So you buy the matching asset allocation ETF, uh, we, usually for a low cost or free, depending on what brokerage you're using in the ETF. And then you end up hold thousands of globally diversified stocks and bonds. So it's really a one-stop solution uh, to all of those issues that we've talked about, how you can use the best evidence to inform your investing. Uh, so it bundles all of that together and tracks indexes and rebalances for you for about 0.25% per year of, in fees. And that includes the fees of the funds themselves and the rebalancing part of it. Yeah, and something I just wanted to add in there as well for the mm -hmm. previous slide um, was just uh, to avoid any confusion, asset allocation ETFs, um, the purchase price for them is less than $10 or free. Some brokerages 
uh, might charge, let's say, $4.99 to buy and then $4.99 to sell. But the price of an actual asset allocation ETF uh, might kind of is also quite low. It might range around from $25 to $35, depending on when you are watching this video. Obviously, if you're watching it later on, it will have gone up. Yeah, and the, the price per unit of the fund isn't going to really influence your decision. So you don't want buying a fund that's worth $25 per unit doesn't mean that it's a less valuable ETF than one that costs $50 per unit. All it means is that you would buy double the number of units of one compared to the other. So what you would do is you take, let's say you had $500 to invest, you take that, divide it by the cost of per unit of the fund and buy that number of units of whatever ETF it is that you're looking at getting. So in terms of uh, I, the way the, what I would be concerned about would be the trading fee, which as you've mentioned, is usually quite low or maybe free depending on the ETF and the brokerage. And then what's the ongoing cost of managing that fund, which in case, which is uh, going to be around 0.25% per year. So quite low. And for that, you get rebalancing as well. So what is rebalancing? Well, you, you have different types of, of funds that you're holding. You may have bonds, you may have emerging markets, you may have uh, non-North American equities, U.S. equities, Canadian equities, and they're all going to be growing at different speeds and rates, which is what we want because that's how it's, that diversification smooths out our volatility. So that's great. But we don't want that to stray too far away if something is growing faster than another. And that's where rebalancing comes in. So this is just a very simple rebalancing example. Let's say you set yourself up and you say, okay, my asset allocation is going to be 50% stocks and 50% bonds, which I've shown here are stocks in red and bonds in green. Let's say I'm investing $10,000 just to make the math easy. Over time, as we've mentioned, stocks tend to grow faster than bonds do. So let's say your portfolio has grown now to be $20,000. But now the stocks are make up 60% of your portfolio and the bonds are 40%. Well, what you would do is you'd sell some of the stocks to buy more of the bonds. So you're selling what's grown more to buy more of what's grown less and then restore yourself back to that balance of what you had planned uh, to have. So there's two components to that. One is that you're, it's, it's a disciplined way of that you're going to be selling things that have grown and are high in price to buy things that have not grown as much and that are lower in price. And the, the, that, that's important for within the equity part of your portfolio in particular. But what's the biggest reason why we balance it is actually that it helps us to manage risk. So if we were to take let's say a 50-50 stock to bond portfolio. Again, the stocks here are red and the bonds are in green and they were to grow over time at what historically the rates have been like. So historically stocks have grown at a much faster rate than bonds, which is what we'd expect since they're riskier. And what would happen if you never rebalanced is over a long period of time, here I've shown a, a 35 year time frame. eventually the stocks would become 87% of your portfolio and the bonds will be 13% of your portfolio. So that's much, much higher risk than what you had intended. You had intended to be 50-50 in terms of your risk you were taking. And in the bottom panel here, I've shown the maximum historical one-year loss with that asset allocation. So with the 50-50 stock to bond asset allocation, you may have seen a 14% drop in a year of your portfolio, which you know, if that scares you a little bit, but doesn't make you sell, that's probably a good asset allocation for you. But let's say you didn't have that and you had this 87% equity. Well, you could have a 27% drop of your portfolio. And you can imagine that would probably happen at the worst possible time. 35 years from now, you're probably about to retire. You're thinking of all the wonderful things you're going to spend your money on. And suddenly your portfolio, a quarter of it disappears. And that is a very scary thing, not only to see, but it can also decrease the survivability of your portfolio due to something called sequence risk, which would be something we'll have to talk about in another episode. So the reason why we were balanced along the way is so that over a longer period of time, we don't get this extreme risk in our portfolio that we weren't planning on having. We want to reset that periodically to make sure that we're staying within our comfort zone. And nice thing about an asset allocation ETF is it does that for you automatically. You don't have to think about buying and selling things and you don't have to often even realize any tax consequences from that because the 
mutual, the ETF itself will do be doing that buying and selling. And because there's constantly money being contributed to it, uh, it may just buy more of what's low rather than sell what's high. Now they do end up doing some of that. So there is some turnover, but it wouldn't be nearly as much as it would be just you as an individual. So we've talked about the evidence between active and passive investing. We've talked about the evidence that fees matter, uh, but what about asset allocation ETFs versus just owning other funds together? Is there any evidence to suggest they might give us an advantage by that nice automated easy rebalancing? So there was a study done in 2019 called the Mind the Gap study. And what they did is they looked at different asset classes. So down here I've shown they've had some equity funds and some fixed income funds. Now these weren't really ETFs they were using. They were just, uh, they were mutual funds in the United States, but the concept is still the same. And what they did is they sorted them out in quartiles of volatility, so or quintiles of volatility. So the least volatile stocks versus the stock funds versus the most volatile stock funds. Uh, because even within stocks, you can have those that are much riskier than others. And they did the same thing within bonds. And what they looked is they looked at the investor return, which is this first column. And they looked at the actual total return of whatever the fund was in the, in the right column. So this right column is the returns that someone would have realized if they had invested like a robot and not been a human being. And the left column is what actual investors who are human beings actually got for their returns. And you can see that there's a difference. For example, in the least volatile equity, there was a difference of about 0.29. And this is called the behavioral gap. So what you can see is that investors actually trailed what a robot investing would have trailed who or a mechanically investing person who's very disciplined would have done. And the more volatile that fund is, the bigger that gap becomes. And that applies both to equities and it applies to bonds. So the more volatile and risky they are, the more likely you are to trail uh, due to bad behavior. And the reason why I'd say it's due to bad behavior is because this happens because the people naturally try to buy with things when they're high and sell things when they're low. And what, or the other way that we do that as well, the markets are really high right now, you know, so I'm going to, going to, uh, I'm going to let it go still because I think there's more to come because it's awesome and everything's great and the news is all positive. In fact, I'm going to buy more of it. So you end up buying more when things are doing really well. Or on the other side, which is the really big danger is things are doing poorly. Like for example, in March of 2020, when the pandemic hit and markets dropped by 20 to 30%, depending what you were looking at, or even over the past year. And there, I bet you there's a lot, I bet you there's a lot of people right now. And this is, you know, 2023, we just went through 2022, which had a market drawdown. We're saying, yeah, well, you know, I'm just going to wait a little bit before I buy my ETFs because, you know, I think the things are going to get worse. Everything's bad. The news is all terrible. And we make those decisions which, where, which we are wired to do at the exact wrong time. And that's why we tend to trail a disciplined investment strategy. Now, they also looked at allocation ETFs or, or mutual funds. It was the American study with mutual funds, which are, can be the lines are gray. And there were, a lot of them were target date funds or other ways of allocating assets. But the bottom line is you basically had a mix of stocks and bonds together and you just bought more units of the same thing. And you can see here, actually the gap as you had a lower risk fund was actually positive, which means that people with the asset allocation ETFs were outperforming the indexes that they were measured against. And there's probably, there's a number of explanations for that. So the one of them is probably the simplicity and automat automated way of doing it. So the more simple and automated a plan you make, the more likely you are just to stick to that rather than try to get fancy and time it. And a lot of these allocation ETFs in this study actually, or allocation mutual funds in this study were actually parts of pension plans, which have some behavioral advantages because people would have money deducted from their paycheck. They would automatically be buying the funds in a, a very mechanical fashion, and they can't just get to them to sell them uh, either. So it there's a behavioral advantage in that it makes it very difficult for them to buy and sell. Now, ETFs are not exactly like that. You do have to buy them. You have to log into your discount brokerage and buy them, but it's a very simple process. And if you do that, 
you, know, you can have automatic money deposited to your accounts and then you just log in once a month and do whatever you're purchasing in is or if you get paid on a less regular basis like a physician does uh, with all of our overhead and everything else I do it about four times a year because that's when I know how much money I've got I transfer that into my brokerage account and I just buy what I need to buy so that's an advantage Rebalancing may have some advantages over volatile periods because it, if you if you have equities that are going up and down uh, at different times, you rebalance those, and because they have the same expected return in the long run, you get to dampen the volatility a bit, and you're automatically buying things when they're low and selling them when they're high, but have the same expected return in the long run. So from the equity standpoint, if you have two, if you have different holdings that have a same long term. Uh, expected return, there's advantage to rebalancing. And there's a particular advantage to rebalancing during time periods where stocks and bonds are inversely correlated. So over the past year, we have had a time period where stocks and bonds have moved in the same direction, both of them went down. And that does happen for periods of time. Uh, but the in the long run, the longest periods of time tend to have bus stocks and bonds moving inversely. And the period of time that this study did look at was actually a volatile period. It was from 2009 to 2019. And uh, they had stocks and bonds moving in opposite directions. So uh, that may have provided some of the edge there as well. Now, that's important to know because who knows what the future holds. We don't know how volatile it's going to be. We don't know how stocks and bonds are going to move with each other. It's constantly changing over time. I think the biggest advantage here is probably the fact that it's simple and easy to do. So what are some of the potential drawbacks of asset allocation ETFs? There's a few of them. Um, because one of the things that you're doing is you're paying someone else to do the rebalancing for you. You could go ahead and buy all of the underlying stocks, or not in stocks, the underlying ETFs yourself. Each of those Asset allocation ETFs are basically a bundle or five or six or seven different ETFs together. You could actually do that, buy that, sell that, and do the math yourself. And you would probably save somewhere about 0.08 to 0.1% per year. And we know fees and returns are probably related. So you are paying a small fee for the privilege of having someone else do the rebalancing. Now, of course, if doing a rebalancing yourself means you're going to delay doing it till you've got time and then you forget and then you're thinking, well, it's not a good time and it makes you behave poorly. Well, you probably cost yourself more than you would have paid for someone to rebalance for you. So you need to consider that against each other. Now, there are some foreign withholding tax inefficiencies. So that's a bit of a complex topic. But the biggest place where you'd see that, and we'll talk about this in another, another talk, would be in an RRSP. You could hold the US listed ETFs in an RRSP individually. Uh, instead of having them bundled up in this fund, and that would save you somewhere between 0.1 and 0.2% per year uh, with some of the, depending on what the stock to bond mix of the asset allocation ETF that you're using. So again, that is a predictable drag on performance at an RRSP, but it's pretty small. There are some issues that could come up someday for you, or they may never come up depending on, on your situation. Uh, one of them is that your asset allocation may change with time. So some people, if they have very limited financial reserve as they approach retirement, are going to have to start taking less risk as they approach retirement and maybe have to add more bonds to their portfolio rather than stocks. One way to simply do that is you could, you could in addition to your asset allocation ETF, as you approach retirement, just start buying a bond ETF uh, to add to it and slowly shift your allocation to be a little bit heavier in the bonds. So by that point, you would probably be very experienced at buying and selling ETFs, and that would be a very simple thing for you to do and not be scary. One of the easiest things about asset allocation ETFs are they're easy and good to use for someone who's starting out and gets nervous about some of these things, but that would be old, old news by then. It may also be something you don't need to do, and we're going to talk about that in a future episode. Having multiple different ETFs gives you multiple different options to about what to buy and sell at different times. And that can be used for tax planning. So there's ways you can harvest capital losses. There's ways that you can harvest capital gains, uh, particularly in a corporation, uh, that can be an advantage from a tax standpoint. And, and having different options to buy and sell from gives you different options to strategically tax plan. So in a given year, you could choose what you're selling 
uh, to minimize your tax bill. And it could even apply if you're giving away uh, things to charity. So if you're giving away appreciated stocks to charity, there's major tax advantages to doing that. And the biggest tax advantage would be selling something that's had a really big capital gain. But if everything's all wrapped up in one fund, well, you can't just sell part, you can't just pick one thing to sell, you're selling a chunk of the mix, as opposed to something that's done really, really well. There are ways to deal with that. And again, we'll talk about that in another episode. And you can deal with it even using asset allocation ETFs. So there's a little teaser for you. The other thing that, that you have is there's less ability to optimize your asset location. Uh, to ta optimize your taxes. So your RSP, TFSA, corporation, a personal taxable account, they all have different tax characteristics and the different holdings from different uh, areas have different tax characteristics too. For example, Canadian stocks will pay eligible dividends, which have a favorable tax treatment. Foreign equities, depending on where they're from and their structure may have foreign withholding taxes. They may have uh, high Canadian taxes because they're taxed as income interest is taxed as income. So you may try to redirect some of those to different tax shelters. And that, that again is another topic for discussion because there's a good argument for the average person to not even bother with it. And for people that are in a higher income tax bracket or have a corporation, there are ways to consider whether to do it as long as it's simple uh, because the potential benefits are relatively small uh, but the potential risks of messing it up become higher and higher uh, if it becomes more and more complicated. So you, again, I think there's a simple way to use asset location using asset allocation ETFs as well, which again is something we could talk about uh, in a future talk because we're going to unpack these ETFs in some further detail uh, in, in upcoming episodes. Just to lead into that, just to give you an idea of what some of the common asset allocation ETFs are, there's more and more of them out there as time goes by because it's become realized this is actually a really good model for investing and it's become very, very popular. But there's four big companies. Now, each of those companies has a flavor of, of different, different uh, asset allocation ETFs that come in a different mix. So the, they all have a all equity version. They have different versions that have 80-20 stocks to bonds is very common, 60-40 is very common, and then they often have a conservative one which has slightly more bonds than stocks. And the big companies out there that are offering these are BlackRock, which are the iShares, and those ETFs start with an X. So XEQT would be the BlackRock ETF that's 100% equity. Bank of Montreal is a major ETF provider. They start with Zeds. So ZEQT would be this, their, their similar version. Vanguard was the first to market with this. And that's why it has a lot of very good brand recognition name. And they start with the Vs. So VEQT would be their version. Horizon has its own version, uh, HGROW, which is all equity. Now, Horizon, the, I will say that the BlackRock, BMO, and Vanguard are, are what I would call conventional ETFs. Horizon has what are called corporate class ETFs, which have a more complicated underlying structure that makes it uh, more tax efficient, particularly in a, things like a corporation. But because of that complex structure, there are some other uh, risks and nuances associated with it, which is we'll have to do that as a completely separate episode to unpack that again. Now you can look, you see here, the fees are 0.2% for most of them. Vanguard's a little more expensive and Horizon, the fee that they show on their site is actually a bit less than this, but what I've gone and I've done is I've shown both the management fee plus their trading costs. Their managed fees are relatively low, but there also are trading costs that are involved because of the underlying structure. When you add those together, though, it's still right in there with the other ETFs. And they all have different versions. So there's X Grow, V Grow, and Z Grow, which would be the 80 20 version. There's balanced versions, which are closer to a stock bond balance. And then there's a conservative version which is closer to being a uh, either even split or slightly more bonds than stocks. So we'll unpack those some more uh, in some detail to do a bit more of a head-head -head comparison about the fees and the taxes in different accounts and a bit about the structure in another episode. Now, there is a question that often students will ask um, or beginners might ask, and that is, 
how do you know what stock versus bond allocation you should have? So generally speaking, for example, sometimes if you're quite young, people might go more for the all equity or the 80 stocks, 20 bonds, um, that sort of allocation. But some individuals, when they're closer to retirement, they might be more inclined to choose something like 60 stocks or 40 stocks. Do you have any suggestions for certain um, questionnaires or uh, how or like what are some ways that individuals can use to determine which stock bond allocation they should pick? Actually, that, that, that's a fantastic question. And it actually leads nicely into what I was going to speak about next, which are some of the resources that are out there. And so on my blog, which is the Looney Doctor blog, I built what I call my DIY investing hub. And what it has is you, you go to this page and it's basically a landing page for a variety of tools and things to help you get started with DIY investing. So there's some basic training, uh, which I'll talk about in a moment, but also within that is what's called, I have, I have this interactive DIY investing guide. And just to disclose my conflict of interest, I do, I'm a Qtrade affiliate. Qtrade is a discount brokerage uh, which means uh, they provide low cost direct investing. So Q Trade, Quest Trade, Interactive Brokers, all the big banks have their own versions of it. Uh, but I built an interactive guide using Q Trade, and people that open account using the link on my site, I get a small fee at no cost to you. But the reason why I did it is because I could build this guide with lots of screenshots. So I have very specific instructions about where to click, screenshots of exactly how to buy and sell and open accounts, move money, do everything uh, step by step. And one of the steps in that interactive guide is assessing your risk capacity and assessing your risk tolerance. So risk capacity is your financial ability to take risk. So some of the things that you mentioned, like if, you, if you're getting close to retirement and you need the money, or you have something coming up in sort of five, six, seven years where you need the money and you don't have other ways of getting that other than what you've invested, well, you, can, you have to take less risk. You have less risk capacity. And then, uh, the, so that's one way of assessing it. Another way is your risk tolerance, which is more about your emotions and your behavior and how much you can handle. And there's a very simple way you could do that. Vanguard's got a simple questionnaire that asks you some very simple questions. Uh, to, and then spits out a stock to bond allocation. That's probably the easiest way for someone getting started. And, and also, so there's that option. And the, the other option within my guide is to do a more comprehensive assessment where you do some different exercises. That, that questionnaire is kind of a start point. And then you can do some exercises to mentally test yourself to see, is that really suitable for you or not? The reality is though, is that you're not gonna get it perfect. And that's okay because you don't have to get it perfect you want to get it close. And then as you invest and do things, you're going to get a better sense of what your risk tolerance really is. When you go through your first bear market or you see things happen, you're going to get a better sense of how that is for you. And you're going to develop hopefully better discipline and things will just be overall less scary. So that's how I would look at assessing my risk tolerance. And there is that tool on my hub that you could use uh, to help yourself with. And there's also some basic training that's there. The, what we talked about today with the asset allocation ETFs, I've written an article about that. I've written articles about the basic process of investing, the basic processes of DIY investing versus advisors and comparing with the all-in-one ETFs, the big four companies that I talked about. I do a very detailed uh, comparison of them there, which uh, we're going to unpack here on uh, in, in this video series further. So with uh, some good discussions. So there are lots of other options that are out there. Great. So I think um, that was a great introduction to asset allocation ETFs. And often a question that students might ask is, what is the difference between investing in a all-in-one or asset allocation ETF versus a robo-advisor? And usually um, I tell them that the main difference is actually the fees. A robo-advisor is very similar to an asset allocation ETF in that you put in a chunk of money into the robo-advisor and they will do that rebalancing for you um, based on your risk tolerance. And they will also invest in different uh, ETFs around the globe. Um, however, the fees for a robo-advisor can be anywhere from 0.5% to 1%. And an asset allocation ETF, you just buy that one asset allocation ETF, the fees tend to be a bit lower than that, maybe around half the amount in fees.
Is there anything else you wanted to add to that uh, common question mark? Yeah, I think I think you've described the biggest difference. So asset allocation ETFs are going to be somewhere around 0.2% a year, plus either free to buy and sell or uh, a small fee. Whereas a robo advisor, the fees are going to be a little bit higher, usually somewhere. And, and it's interesting because even with the robo advisors, they often will give you the management fee, but you have to know what the fees of the funds that the robo advisor is buying to and add those together. When you add them together, it usually ends up somewhere between 0.5 and 1%, depending on the one they're using. The other adv potential advantage of a robo advisor is it's very it's a little bit easier to fully automate. So with a robo advisor, you can set it up so that it automatically takes you know a thousand dollars out of your account every month and puts it into your investment account and it invests it using your asset allocation. Whereas with uh, asset allocation ETFs, you can set up your discount brokerage to automatically take a thousand dollars out of your account, put it in each month, but you then have to log in and and buy the ETFs, which takes about five minutes. But, uh, you know, there is that extra step that you have to do, whereas a robo-advisor, you can set up to be 100% fully automated. Whereas once you get going with an asset allocation ETF, you may ha you have, you know, it may take five or 10 minutes per month or every few months when you decide to to do it, to, uh, to, to do that. So there is a slight uh, automation advantage with a robo-advisor. The other thing that I would say is that being an ETF or a robo advisor doesn't mean it's a hundred percent passive either. So, for example, uh, these funds all have a slightly different slant to different, different markets. The, some manager somewhere has made a decision that they think some mix of Canada, U.S., and other assets is going to do slightly better than some other mix. So, there is some component of management there. It's not completely passive. And I know with the horizon, when they sometimes they have shifted that around a little bit. Uh, with time. And with the robo advisors, some of them are more active than others. And they shift their things or they shift their asset allocation around and hold, you know, like they might add gold and take gold away, for example, one of the big robo advisor companies did that recently. And some of these, yeah, so there is a potentially active component uh, to both ETFs and uh, robo advisors It tends to be mostly passive with the ETFs, though. Yeah, Robo and another advisors, I think has a bit more potential there. Yeah, and another very um, common question that beginners might ask is, what is the difference between an index fund and an ETF exchange traded fund? Do you want to maybe take that question? Sure, it's 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 a bit of a technicality. Uh, an index fund is strictly tracking an index, which which to do that, uh, it's actually there there are some structural complexities. In that so it's actually very difficult for us to access that so what so it, it invests directly in in the index there it's a it's a more complicated structure whereas an etf is there are some decisions being made about when to buy and sell the holdings that are on the index but they're not holding the index directly what they're doing is saying okay this is the proportion of the different companies that are on that index and we're going to buy and sell our equities to match that, uh, but there is some degree of management decision that's going on, going into that in terms of the buying and the selling. So it's not going to 100% track the index, and it's and well, that, that's something that's called tracking error. And I wrote an article on my blog about it where I actually looked at a bunch of in, ETFs because this is one of the things that's pointed at, at by active managers. Oh well, there's too much tracking error in an ETF. Well. The long story short is that it's a it, it's not a big issue. It's what I call a nothing burger, which means there's no beef there, and uh, that's what I call the article. It's, it's ETF uh, tracking error. Where's the beef or something like that? So that's on my my blog. And the other thing that's interesting is that in ETFs, because there actually is a bit of a management component, what they do is some of the ETFs will actually lend out some of their securities for people that want to do options and other fancy maneuvers and they actually pay the ETF uh, company for the privilege of borrowing stocks and things like that. So the ETF companies can actually generate a little bit of income. And in some cases that actually, if you look what their tracking error is, uh, it's actually less than what their fees are because they've actually generated some income off of those other revenue streams that have offset their fees. So even though their management fee may be you know, 0.25%, well, maybe they're also offsetting that a little bit with some of these other methods that they're using. 
Yeah. It's going to be different for every fund because different, different indexes that you're tracking have different opportunities for that, like small cap. Uh, small cap U.S. funds have the most opportunity for that, probably, but uh, but that's another slight difference. That's a re- that's a bit of a real tech. It's a bit of a technical issue that for us as end users probably doesn't matter. Yeah, and basically all you need to know is that in Canada, um, most people tend to buy into ETFs if they're looking for a diversified investment. Uh, index funds are diversified as well, and they also um, buy into multiple stocks. Um, however, index funds can be quite expensive and they're traded just once at the end of the trading trading day. Um, and they can be around like the 1000 or even higher than that um, price, whereas ETFs can be much cheaper, under $100 or maybe like 20 to $30 around there as well. Yes, yeah, so they both do very similar things. ETFs are just much more cost effective and accessible. All right, great. Thank you for um, listening to our talk for today. And next time, we'll be diving deeper into comparing the different types of all-in-one ETFs or asset allocation ETFs. Um, And we'll also touch more on, you know, when you are at different stages in your life, which type of ETFs to use and how to kind of, you know, add bond ETFs and things like that to make sure it matches your risk tolerance. So thank you for listening and don't forget to like and subscribe or leave a comment if you have an idea or a question regarding a future lecture.